Part 1 Jack is on his way to Margaret's house party. He is phoning her for directions. First, you'll have some time to look at questions 1 to 5. Now listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 5. Jack has got lost on his way to Margaret's party. He is phoning her for directions. Hello, is that Margaret? Yes, who's speaking? Margaret, it's Jack. I think I'm lost. I can't see a signpost and... Jack, so where are you now? Well, I'm a bit confused about the directions, but I'm at a T-junction. What can you see around you? I can see a pub on the corner. Can you see the name of the pub? Wait a minute. Let me see. It's hard to see in the dark. Yes, I can read it now. It's called the Lion's mm, Head. Oh, the Lion's Head. OK, well, then you're not too far away. Go straight ahead through the traffic lights to the next T-junction. Sorry, I didn't hear you. What did you say? I said, just go through to the next T-junction. OK. Now what? Well, there's a park in front of you and a large two-storey building on the corner. Ah, uh, yes, I can see them. OK. So now turn left. Hang on. You're coming up the street, so you'll have to turn right. OK, got it. What's the name of your street? It's Wesley Street. W-E-S-L-E-Y, number 70. We're the fifth house on the left. You should see a red letterbox and some bushes in front of the house. OK. Fifth house, number 70. I should be there soon. Am I late for the party? It sounds like things are happening there. No, it's only just started. That's good. I should be there in the next ten minutes. See you soon. Jack hangs up and walks on. Seven minutes later, he calls Margaret again, as he still can't find the house. You now have some time to look at questions 6 to 10. As you listen, answer questions 6 to 10. speaking. Hi Margaret, it's Jack again. Sorry to bother you. Listen, would you mind doing me a favour? Of course, what? Could you tell Mike I have got his camera? I've tried to send him a text message, but it's not going through. Oh, he's not here yet. Oh dear, he said he'd be there early. He might be lost too. Okay, I'll call him. What's his number? 0482 563379. Oh, so that's 0485 no, no, 0482 563379. OK, I'll call him right away. But where are you now? Well, I'm in your street, but I still can't find your house. I can't see the numbers very clearly, or a red letterbox. It's pretty dark. I thought you said it was easy to find. Oh, OK, wait there. I'll come outside and get you. All right, then. And don't worry about calling Mike. I'll try to call him now. Hang on, there's someone coming down the street. It looks like Mike. Oh, and I can see the letterbox now. It was hidden behind a bush. See you soon. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part two. Part two. You're going to listen to a talk about the food we eat. 
First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 15. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 15. Welcome to the food we eat, sponsored by Safeway. Increasingly, we know more about the effects of our eating habits and lifestyles on our health. While new information can change old ideas, the new stories can often be confusing. At Safeway, we try to help customers not only in the range and types of food offered, but also by providing up-to-date, reliable information in areas we know are of interest and which relate to the diet we eat. Today, we are going to talk about sugar. Recently, doctors have been advising us to eat less sugar. The health recommendation to use less sugar is for two reasons. Firstly, for the sake of our teeth, since the amount and frequency of sugar consumption links to decay. Secondly, as sugar is a good source of calories, it can easily be a problem if we tend to be overweight. The dental risk is because bacteria which occur naturally in our mouth feed on carbohydrates, sugar and starch, to form plaque and acid. Plaque is a sticky coating that prevents the bacteria being removed by saliva. The acid attacks the tooth itself. This takes time, however, so the trick is to avoid sticky foods like sweets, which stay around in crevices feeding the bacteria. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 16 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 16 to 20. Regular brushing, preferably with a fluoride toothpaste, helps remove particles and resist acid. The worst thing you can do is nibble sweet things between meals. It puts your teeth under constant attack. A sweet tooth develops gradually. And you might be surprised at how you can steadily unlearn the taste, taking in fewer calories and saving your teeth. Here are some ways. A. Gradually cut down the sugar in tea and coffee till you can stop altogether or switch to sweetness. B. Choose snacks with a lower sugar content. Fresh fruit, raw vegetables, crackers. Milk or low-flat natural yoghurt. Remember, some fruits like raisins have lots of sugar. C. Look for reduced sugar alternatives. There are more and more around, from diet drinks to yoghurts, even jams and sauces. D. Try gradually to cut back on the sugar you use in cooking, especially in baking. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 25.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 21 to 25. Good afternoon, everybody. It's Ronald Jaff with this week's edition of Movie Talk. First, let's look at the films this week in the theatre. The Kid Rides Again, When You Find Love and Wronged. The last of the three, Wronged, is definitely the best. In fact, one of the best films in a long time, with Henry Michelson and Joanne Seymour. It is about a man who gets a life sentence for a murder he did not commit. In the style of the films of the 40s and 50s, it is a modern story of a man and his wife, wonderfully played by Joanne Seymour. They fight to make people believe Thompson is the wrong man and not the killer. The strength of their love is wonderful, even after Thompson has been in prison for 15 years. Of course, I won't tell you what happens after Thompson's 15th year in prison. That would ruin the story. But if you see no other film, you should see this one. The story may be old, but the acting is great, and it will hold your attention from beginning to end. Unfortunately, I can't say the same for When You Find Love. Just another silly story about how boy meets girl, boy loses girl, boy gets girl again, and they live happily ever after. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 26 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 26 to 30. Hollywood ever get tired of such stupid films? Yet, on a New England college campus, the star of the movie, Tommy Seal, is a freshman. He meets the two years older Stephanie Fool, played by Sally Evans. In real life, she must be at least 30, not 20. Well, Billy, our hero, has had a hard time with Stephanie, after all, he is so much younger. But they fall in love in about a minute, as long as it takes to take a picture with a Polaroid. And they are both so happy, in true paradise, until, that is, until Buck, the star football player, played by Ronco Starr, the only good acting in the film, steals Stephanie away from the poor Billy. He is, after all, a senior and football star. And the rest of the film is about, naturally, how Billy gets Stephanie back, making her remember their love. He shows her that he, not Buck, is the man for her. Well, if you can stand a stupid story and bad acting, then take your eight-year-old child to see When You Find Love. Anyone older will leave the theatre before the movie ends. And finally, The Kid Rides Again, a western about a young cowboy, Kit Barnes, who stops the bad guys, the robbers, the killers, and plain old bullies, and helps the good guys. Kit is fast with a gun, and never once in this cowboy. Kit is the cowboy who never stays in one place for a very long time, who leads a lonely but very free life. Nothing new on the storyline, but a good classic-style western with good acting. Peter Sells as Kit catches just the right mood. He's an excellent and natural cowboy. There are beautiful scenes of the open country in the West and enough action to hold your interest. A good cowboy film for those who, like me, always enjoy seeing the Old West. And now, before we go on with the news from Hollywood, a word from our sponsor. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. You'll hear a lecture about Iron Age in Britain. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully to the message and answer questions thirty-one to forty. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Today I am going to introduce to you a special age in Britain, the Iron Age. People at that time, you may be surprised to hear that, seem close to the men and women of today because archaeologists discovered that they tried to vary their diet, improve their homes, and follow fashions. The period known as the Iron Age lasted in Britain for about eight hundred years, from seven fifty B.C. to forty-three A.D. There had been several dramatic changes by the end of the Iron Age, including coinage. Wheel thrown pottery, etc. People had started to live in larger and more settled communities. Furthermore, because of the differences in climate and geography, someone living in Yorkshire or Ireland would have eaten different food, worn different clothing, and lived in different housing conditions from someone living in southern Britain. Caesar commented that Britain was a land of small farms, and this has been proven by the archaeological evidence. Since Iron Age society was primarily agricultural, it is safe to presume that the daily routine would have revolved around the maintenance of the crops and livestock. Small farmsteads were tended by and would have supported isolated communities of family or extended family size. They produced enough to live on and a little extra to exchange for commodities that the farmers were unable to provide for themselves. For those farms, harvested crops were stored in either granaries that were raised from the ground on posts, or in bell-shaped pits two to three meters deep. Some four thousand five hundred of these storage pits have been found within the hill fort interior at Danebury in Hampshire, and if they were all used to store crops, this would have essentially made the site one large fortified granary. Although the archaeological evidence shows that cattle and sheep would have been the most common farm animals, it is known that pigs were also kept. The animals would have aided the family not only with heavy farm labor in the case of the cattle, such as the plowing of crop fields, but also as a valuable form of wool or hide and food products. Horses and dogs are also observed in the archaeological evidence from both faunal remains and artifacts. Horses were used for pulling two or four wheeled vehicles, carts, chariots, while dogs would have assisted in the herding of the livestock and hunting. Besides agriculture and stock raising, the architecture in Iron Age is also worth mentioning. A very well preserved settlement has been discovered at the site of Chiselster in Cornwall. It was made up of individual houses of stone with garden plots. In Wessex, the typical building on a settlement would have been the large round house. All of the domestic life would have occurred within this. The main frame of the round house would have been made of upright timbers, which were interwoven with coppiced wood, usually hazel, oak, ash, or pollarded willow, to make wattle walls. This was then covered with a daub made of clay, soil, straw, and animal manure that would weatherproof the house. The roof was constructed from large timbers and densely thatched. The main focus of the interior of the house was the central open hearth fire. This was the heart of the house to provide cooked food, warmth, and light. Because its importance within the domestic sphere, the fire would have been maintained twenty-four hours a day. Beside the fire may have stood a pair of fire dogs, such as those found at Baldock in Herefordshire. Or suspended above it, a bronze cauldron held up by a tripod and attached with an adjustable chain. The ordinary basic cooking pots would have been made by hand, from the local clay, and came in varying rounded shapes, occasionally with simple incised decorations. As for eating, bread would have been an important part of any meal, and was made from wheat and barley. The dough would have then been baked in a simple clay-domed oven. Of which evidence has been found in Iron Age houses, the barley and rye could also have been made into a kind of porridge. In addition to this, the grain was also fermented to make beer, and the surface foam that formed was scraped off and used in the bread-making process. The interior of the house was an ideal place for the drying and preservation of food. Smoke and heat from the constant fire would have smoked meat and fish. And would have dried herbs and other plants perfectly. Salt was another means of preserving meat for the cold winter months, 
but this was a commodity that could not be made at a typical settlement. Well, you can see that Iron Age people lived a decent life, didn't they? I'm going to introduce their culture and leisure time next time. Thank you. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers.